um, Dr. Margaret Boone Rappaport and uh, also Dr. Reverend Dr. Chris Corberly, uh, who are um, going to talk to us on the subject of cultural, moral and religious capacities. How important are they and in what order did they evolve? So that's an enormous subject, and and what a, what 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 right do uh, these pair have have to uh, opine on the subject? Well, first of all, um, Margaret uh, is a cultural anthropologist and biologist who publishes in the areas of human cognitive evolution, science and religion, and eco theology. Uh, this. Um, subject is somewhat looking back into the past, but actually Margaret is a futurologist um, as well as a pasturologist um, and is based, I think, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and also, I think you um, were lead editor of a book, The Human Factor in the Settlement of the Moon. So there's no dimension that you don't reach into. Um, you've run your own consulting firm and you've also worked for a number of government agencies um, in your time, Margaret. Um, on the other hand, uh, Chris, um, you're a, a Jesuit priest um, in terms of your main profession, but uh, a part of the Vatican Observatory Research Group, uh, adjunct associate astronomer at the Department of Astronomy, University of Arizona. Um, and you have a, um, an active ministry as well alongside um, all of that. Um, I've already mentioned you are uh, being an alumnus of um, Heathrop College. So uh, one more of your publications is um, Stellar Spectral Classification, uh, of which you're co-author, I think. Um, but what is it that um, brings uh, some commonality between this pair? Um, it is that they are both co-founders of something called the Human Sentience Project. Uh, which sounds actually to me slightly unnerving. And I'd, I'd love actually, um, whether now or later on, you, you mention a, a few words about what that's all about. Um, I assume that this subject that you're going to talk about now a little is a little bit related to that. Um, so without any more ado, I'm going to pass over to Margaret and to Chris to take us forward from here. Just one last thing that, um, uh, when, there's going to be a screen share of some slides which take up the whole screen. Um, I think for the most part uh, in Zoom, when, when we're using that format, there's a smaller box that appears with some people's heads in them. If that starts to get in the way of your of viewing the slides, you can just minimize it. The top left of the that pop-out box with the people's heads in it, you can minimize to see the whole screen. Over to you, Margaret and Chris. Oh, Chantel first. Yeah. Yeah. That's her book. It's a book, and um, I, I suppose uh, you know our research has been going on a good number of years with various papers, particularly um, in the journal Zygon by very indult of the editor at that time, who kept accepting our papers. Uh, but then we thought, let's bring it together. And at that stage, um, I found that uh, someone that I'd known from a conference many years before. Uh, Dr. Andrew Newberg, actually PhD and medical doctor, uh, a neuroscientist, had invited contributions on the topic of neurotheology. And we realized this would be a wonderful kind of grounding of that series. And so we proposed to Andrew um, to have uh, the book. And so he put it to Rutledge and they said yes. So that's our problem. Oh, oh, and there's a paperback version too, so that's why Margaret's right. So maybe we can start and uh, I'll share the screen. And if I get the right one to share, it'll be that. And if I do that, then I think you can see the whole screen. Is that right? Can people see? Okay. Um, so, cultural morals, there's our title, there's us. Um, the, the two gentlemen up in the, on the right hand side are um, our own uh, Homo sapiens at the top, and under is Homo erectus. So, uh, our wonderful ancestor, amazingly, but that can come a little later. So, basically, you know, our book on, that we showed on the emergence of religion in 
human evolution is about science, but it is also about religion. It's about the evolution of human religious capacity, and it draws on scientific findings that shore up our conclusion that religion is a non-obligatory neurocognitive trait of our species, Homo sapiens. Our research has traced a fascinating 65 million year journey back through evidence that human religious thinking has a natural organic foundation. This does not provide guidance on how to be spiritual, but it will hopefully make us all the more comfortable with the idea that our pursuit of religious experience is reasonable that it has an origin in the evolution of our species and that religious thinking is not unusual or weak or some sign of a less advanced way of being. We both strongly hold that the institutional role of religion is to support the social group, whatever that social group happens to be. If it strays into other purposes that are economic or political or it is co-opted somehow for the pursuit of activities that degrade, malign, or maim anyone, and it is no longer religion in the sense that we mean. Our focus is on religious thinking as one aspect of the evolution of human cognition. Our task has been to search the findings of modern science for indications of evolutionary innovation that could eventually engender religious thinking. It is true that not many other scholars have done the same, primarily because the findings we use from genomics, neuroscience, and paleoneurology are so new. We're in search of the origins of a cognitive human capacity. So we do not attempt to measure religious behavior that can be mimicked and its measurement contested. Instead, we present an evolutionary model for what appears phenotypically as the persistent goal to experience the numinous, the supernatural, that which appears to humans as outside their everyday life, above it, around it, at its foundation. We ask, why is religion so important to so many humans? Not so simply, it's our biological inheritance. But it is an option, like the cognitive capacity for reading. Religious thought is not a cognitive trait that is required, like the infant's perception of the mother's breast, but a cognitive trait that is variable, complex in origin, with the operation of numerous brain networks, and sometimes a human being's own choice to express. Margaret and I come, as uh, Stephen described, from two very different backgrounds, but we meet in the middle in the search of an explanation for why humans in society after society worldwide and throughout the history of humans on Earth have pursued this thing called religion. Yes, Margaret is an anthropologist and I am an astronomer. Both trained in the sciences, Margaret's a Presbyterian and I'm a Jesuit and Catholic priest. Yes, Jesuits are Catholics. In this joint enterprise, we come to the study of religion obliquely from a broader interest in how and why Humans think differently from other species. Religious thinking is just one of the differences, there are many. Other scientists search rightly for the reflections of religious thinking in our near relatives who are extinct. Their efforts are not yet complete, but they are reasonable and as methodologies for investigating our genetic, archaeological, and paleobiological past improve, future scientists will answer outstanding questions about exactly when human religious thinking began. Did Neanderthals, for example, have religious thinking? If so, 
that could press religious thinking back to the divergence of the human and, ne and Neanderthal lines in Africa, now estimated at 800,000 years ago. At the present, the answers to timing questions remain open to further scientific investigation. Although we identify the species in which religious thinking first appeared, and we estimate the time of its appearance. Ours will surely not be the last estimation. It'll be exciting to follow proof of its appearance in journals and newspapers, because evidence is forthcoming from evolutionary institutes and archaeological digs at an increasingly fast pace. Let's stay tuned. In deference to those scholars who search longingly for the origins of religious thinking and behavior in our nearest living creatures, uh, relatives, the anthropoid apes, we express our gratitude for their worthwhile research in primatology. They report, report glimmers of apparent religious understanding and behavior in chimpanzees and bonobos. But we conclude, based on scientific evidence in genomics, paleoneurology, and modern neuroscience, that they do not record human religious thinking or behavior. Our conclusion is that those capacities are our species alone, and we present our logic by delving into scientific findings, always with an eye toward our baseline of knowledge, archaeology. Whatever projections are made back into prehistory by the new cognitive archaeology, it must adhere to the evidence that comes out of the ground and its analysis or reanalysis, because methods and interpretations improve over time. Human evolution is documented not only in our own genome but by the painstaking work of field researchers spent over archaeological digs and their amazing increasingly clever methods of realizing substance for and dates. The remains of others like us are in the earth in carefully selected places, in the right stratigraphy, and in places where our ancestors roamed, hunted, and evolved. Religious thinking has a solid evolutionary foundation whose biological innovations go back to the origin of the primates 65 to 55 million years ago. So archaeology counts backwards. Since that time, additional evolutionary innovations have occurred adding layer upon layer of biology and behavior until around 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens emerged with the brain to accomplish religious thinking and theological creativity. Our proof emerges in the fascinating details that follow. On the human evolutionary line, there were species with traits that helped to form a foundation for religious thinking, but this was not religious thinking per se. Furthermore, the living species who are most closely related to us have their own evolutionary histories. Each living and extinct species has its own distinctive traits, and our species does too. Religious thinking is an important one, but we have many other unique traits too, which fit together well with the trait of religious thinking, such as secondary, Altriciality. Technically, secondary altriciality means a period of dependence of offspring on parents, and especially among primates, on the social group, which extends past early infancy, primary altriciality. In our evolution, the lifespan extended to produce adolescence at one end and longevity at the other. It lengthened out to give humans sufficient time to acquire advanced neurocognitive traits, practice them, use them, and teach them to others. As a species, we evidence maturity in some neurocognitive traits, such as moral thinking, 
and wisdom as late as the 20s or 30. Like secondary altruciality, longevity, mental illness, and the capacity for culture, religious thinking is unusual in mammals. It makes humans use unique and distinctive. However, let us be quick to say that religious capacity does not necessarily use unusual brain organs and networks to support it. Instead, it uses some of the same brain organs and networks that were originally used for hunting, gathering, tracking, wayfinding, storytelling, and family support and defense. For example, the parietal lobes are known to help us in image and manipulate visuospatial information. We propose, based on modern, modern cognitive research, that the parietal lobes are also actively involved in imagining, organizing, and considering regions where supernatural beings exist. The parietals also help humans see the world in the interaction of those beings. Wow. The original title for this book was Staying Alive, Becoming Religious. And we chose that dual emphasis because we repeatedly saw that the brain capacities which helped early humans survive also endowed them with religious thinking. It's not unusual for brain organs and networks to have multiple purposes or for some brain capacities to be assigned to one side of the brain or, or the other while the other side maintains its own. Evolution is a conservative process that makes use of that which is available. Brain networks are exacted, it's called, for new purposes, imbuing humans with yet additional capacities. Our brains have perhaps thousands of different capacities and many of them feed into religious thinking and experience, cognitive capacities, emotional capacities, and intellectual capacities. The science of these networks is still new. We are presenting science, but it helps to illuminate the origins of spiritual life in our species. The pastiche we present is fragmentary in some ways, like our knowledge of the human genome. We present findings on some of the few known genes that affect religious thinking. There will be many more genes identified, so the massive progression toward religious thinking as a cognitive trait, which we outline, will change as the science changes. Just as old movies from the 1920s were black, white, and flickering, the sweep of our story is smooth but incomplete, sewn together by logic, but firm in the conviction that something like this must have happened because here we are today, with this unique tendency to think about the imaginary and label it supernatural, to find substance and peace in mild to radical altered states of consciousness, and to frame stories and rules to guide our children from tales about unusual, otherworldly, and hallowed beings who once lived long ago. Spirits, ancestors, gods. We call them by different names, but the species commonalities worldwide and through history are remarkable. They signal a common cognitive beginning. We are struck by the ability of all adult humans to recognize religious behavior when they see it, even if it, even if it is from a very different culture and in a different time. We know it when we see it. Our goal is to be informative, a bit provocative, and to convey our sense of excitement about all the new scientific findings that are rapidly emerging from the work of so many around the world. 
The story cannot rely on a single scientific discipline. We cross-reference find findings from at least nine disciplines to tell a multidisciplinary story. Anthropology. Stones and bone archaeology. The new cognitive archaeology. Cognitive science. Genetics. Population genetics. Human genomics. Paleoneurology and neuroscience. We also rely from time to time on modern philosophers to address the questions for which no scientific methods have yet emerged. Still, our story hinges largely on the common sense of modern science, which has perturbed so many since its emergence in the Renaissance. We address all religious beliefs and all humans living and extinct. We time, we use time frames in the latest literature, knowing full well that they will change with new finds from the view, new understandings and new cross disciplines. This is a hopeful time for the science of religion. My colleague has done a fine job on the cognitive science of religion. They examine religious behavior. Our approach is to examine how religious thinking could possibly have emerged in the evolution of a series of species leading to us. And then we ask, what will come next? What will religious thinking evolve into? And how? And why? We use cognitive science in a different way, projecting it backward into the species who span the millions of years of evolution from which we have emerged. It is important to remember that we study people like you, like us, and others who are becoming us. They were a little different from us, but not very much. It can be easy to forget in all the scientific terminology that this book is about us. In humankind's long progression from among the ancient Miocene apes of Africa, they have sought release, amusement, delight, and escape from the self-consciousness that evolution handed them. It's a heavy burden to see oneself on the timeline, to know of one's ultimate demise, to realize that mistakes can be made that hurt others, and willingly accept the ultimate control of the social group. All of this is a burden that needs healing. We as a species were dealt a heavy blow. We know right from wrong. We live self-consciously and tentatively, and we relish the experiences that can shoulder part of that burden just a little bit more. Well done. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Very um, Thank you for we, all your attention. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was great. You, did, you read it so beautifully. Um, and we did mention Dr. Newbrook. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I am going to, well, let me mention a couple of things first. Um, I think that I failed to go back and change a date in the preface, which is partly what Chris read from, um, about, from about, 300,000 years to about 400,000 years ago. I think that the latest finds of full Homo sapiens in Africa come from closer to 400,000 than 300,000. Uh, that's when you find this very round uh, skull vault. Okay, I'm gonna um, hop, skip and jump through this sequence of key innovations. The key innovations that we <clears throat> were searching for were those that we thought had some logical relationship to religious capacity, to religious thinking. So um, there was a concept in the expanded evolutionary synthesis that's current now. It's the expanded uh, concept of evolution beyond Darwin. Uh, and the notion of a key innovation 
was that they gave an impetus, uh, an ability for certain taxonomic groupings to expand further, to evolve further. So these key innovations will go from when the primates started. Of course, there were things that happened before that too. Uh, 65 uh, million years ago, uh, we have the development of sociality of a certain type, and that was sociality in troops. You have a lot of mammals that associate with each other socially at different times and so forth, but primates do it in troops, and it's a full-time uh, organization. Uh, number two, reorganization of the lateral medial cerebellum. This is an instance of parallel evolution. It occurred in three orders, in primates, in cetacea, and in the, in the pinnipeds. Cetaceans, as you know, are the uh, like um, uh, sea lion and dolphins, and the pinnipeds are the seals. They're the seals are the ones that go so late, 30 million years ago. This lateral medial cere cerebellar uh, reorganization really has to do with laying the foundation for um, capacity, for RAM, for random access memory uh, in these three orders. Now, what we did with it was different from what the seals or the cetaceans did, but it basically means uh, innovation, intelligence. Uh, and that foundation was laid a very long time ago. Um, around 19 million years ago, you have something called the basic ape model. It stabilizes. It's different from monkeys that came before. Apes are big, they're demonstrative, and they uh, have a long uh, lifespan. Um, but proconsul kind of stabilized that model around 19, 000, 19 million years ago. Um, next, realignment of the senses in some apes uh, 25 to 10 million years ago. These senses were uh, developed in different combinations for different ones of the apes. The ones that led to humans, the late apes that led to humans, uh, emphasize hearing and vision. And as you can see, uh, hearing and vision is, is really quite important in religious experience. Number five, lengthening developmental trajectory. What happened is that two segments of lifespan that weren't really there before, one is youth, adolescence, and the other is senescence, old age. They really weren't emphasized or, or, or used in specific ways among the apes, uh, the way that human beings do. And that was so important because it allows uh, advanced neurocognitive traits to be taught, to be taught by the older and learned by the young. Uh, and it was given a long time to happen. So we developed slowly, we develop slowly beginning right at the beginning where we're born fairly immature, but we also continue to grow fairly slowly and um, develop slowly. Okay, again, among some late Miocene apes, the down regulation of aggression, uh, this had to happen. Uh, if you look at a troop of chimpanzees, they, they just have an extremely aggressive um, demeanor often, not all the time, but often. Um, and somehow our ancestors lost some of that. Uh, one of the things that I think it comes out of this book so obviously is that humans retained a lot of aggression, but they also at the same time uh, are capable of extraordinary beneficence uh, to each other. So we've got them both. And that took uh, something that I think is called a, a modified domestication complex. Uh, we retained a lot of juvenile traits into adulthood. And of course, ape juveniles, they don't fight as much as, as adults. So, um, 
again, you think there's a lot happening between 25 and 10 million years ago. That's true. A lot did happen. And it hinged on, let me just make a side comment here. It hinged on this enormous population of apes. Right now, the apes are in decline. They're not there many, many left. But they were all over Europe, all over Asia. And then they went down into Africa finally when the, <coughs> when the sea levels fell. So a lot is happening because there were a lot of different kinds of apes for it to happen in. Okay, seven, uh, continued brain hypertrophy. It grows a lot, big brain and upgrades intelligence to manage aggression. I, I think we've just said that. Number eight, variety of genetically based sensitivities. This is really interesting because this continues to today. Uh, human beings have this enormous variety of genetically based sensitivities. Uh, for example, some of them are sensitive to only members of our social group. You know, we're ready for action, we're ready to help. Uh, other sensitivities are broader. It's not just our social group, but all members, all humans. So the sensitivities vary. Um, and they continue to develop. Number nine, some biological foundations of cultural capacity. And I say some because it had to continue. Uh, the reason we take, take it back that far from 10 to 8 million years ago is because we find glimmers of cultural capacity in chimpanzees and gorillas. They're there. It's not big like culture for us, but it's, it's, you can see it. Um, we talk about, Chris and I laugh about the chimpanzees that take uh, reeds of grass and stick them in their teeth. And in some groups of chimpanzees, it's kind of a fashion, right? So um, culture, rural capacity uh, emerged uh, 10, to, uh, eight, 10 to 8 million years ago, some of it did. And then the hominid and pongid lines diverged in Africa and some group of apes in Africa, um, a as yet undocumented division occurred. Okay, then we have the genus Homo. Around 2.8 million years ago, we've got Homo habilis, and his key innovation really was aggressive scavenging. Um, number 11, moral capacity emerges, in our model anyway, about um, 1.5 million years ago in Homo erectus. And, and then separately, religious capacity evolves in Homo sapiens only. Uh, Chris mentioned the parietal lobes. There are these lobes that make the, the skull round up at top here. And one of the reasons we think that, that Homo neanderthalensis did not have full-blown religious capacity is because the parietals aren't shaped that way. The, homo, uh, the Neanderthals have big bulges here, but the parietals aren't as large. Pecunius. Oh, uh, one of the most important um, aspects of the parietals is the precunius, which is we trace to um, a lot of aspects of religious capacity. It's too, we, we did a whole speech on this one time, but anyway, the precunius is important. And then lately, of course, the neural networks have come up. Um, now then, what we did with this key sequence of 12 innovations was we grouped them. And I want you to think about this uh, as we go to, through the groupings again, very, very, very quickly, is what do you think um, some extraterrestrial would need to build a spaceship? <laughs> and since we are the only example we have so far of sentience, and we need to start planning for this meeting, I guess a lot of people think, um, we're gonna have to think about what it is that we're gonna meet. Okay, so let's go to slide four. And I, we grouped them into, now then, <laughs> with, it was daunting to call them factors. I've done a real live 
multivariate factor analysis. So uh, I do have some background in factor analysis, but I actually did group them informally. Factor one is sociology and problem solving. You can't build a spaceship without sociology and group problem solving. Factor two, reorganization of the cerebellum and the emergence of high computational capacity intelligence and innovation. Again, this creature who comes, if it one comes uh, to visit us here on earth, um, is going to be have to be a pretty smart species. Number three, long developmental trajectory allows for advanced neurocognitive traits to be taught and learned. They're gonna have to have some kind of lifespan uh, as well as we do, so that young people can learn uh, the fine nuances of diplomatic speech and negotiation. Uh, they're gonna be able to learn what Chris knows to look at uh, you know, screens full of numbers and come out of that screen of numbers with, uh, oh, what, what kind of star is that? You know, This is pretty advanced. Uh, neurocognitive thinking. Did you know that you were engaging in advanced neurocognitive? Um, factor four, ch changes in senses and sensitivities to fine tune communication. There's been some really good science fiction stuff on this. Um, we've got speech, we've got smell, uh, we've got these sensitivities that we don't know too much about yet that we have. Um, but anything that can improve communication and make it more rapid is going to uh, go along with a high intelligence. Factor five, organic evolutions of the capacities of culture, morality, and origin. Well, as you saw in, in the third slide, culture seems to have been the one that in part developed earliest, and that was glimmers of it in the late apes. And then we think moral capacity emerged in Homo erectus and religious capacity emerged in Homo sapiens uh, just around 350 to 400,000 years ago. So that, that, that is the question. That is the discussion question. If you want to take it, you can do something else. Uh, but what can we expect in ET? Um, uh, I'll just give you an example. There's a wonderful movie called Arrival, and it's got these, what is it, 13 foot tall heptapods that float around in water. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense that this kind of species was active, intelligent, problem solving in groups. It just, I mean, it had to be, they, it, 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 the evolutionary history of such a creature would have to have taken it back into the water. And um, that gets us into how smart dolphins are. So I'm gonna uh, stop at that point. Um, but anyway, we're having an awful good time. And um, I think the, the main thing I wanna say again, which Chris said at the beginning was, this is science and it's the scientific evolution of a capacity that I think a lot of people don't appreciate as a capacity. A lot of people think religious thinking is some kind of something weird. <coughs> it's not. Uh, it's part of what we can do as a species. Not all of us do it. Some of us choose not to, but it's given to us in our biology for most of us. And so none of this science reduces anybody's uh, ability to either have faith or not have faith. That's not the goal, is to understand faith. It's to understand the origin of, spe of a species who can have faith. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Goodness. <laughs> Goodness indeed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you very much, um, Margaret. Um, it is, it's, it's an unboundable area, isn't it? Um, and if you talk about nine disciplines, um, then I'm quite sure there could be others that you draw in, even on a secondary basis, if you have a spare moment or two. Um, 
And thank you very much for the, the careful way that you picked through it, um, uh, tailoring it for the, uh, for the audience. Um, so um, I'm, I'm trying to work out, I'd like to open it to the floor because I'm sure there'll be any number of um, observations and responses, but I just want to throw one thing in. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, speak from memory, but I not that long ago read um, G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy, which I, if I've got the right book, it starts off in um, uh, very deep down French caves and observations about the uh, cave paintings that were found dating back tens of thousands of years. And G.K. Chesterton, not necessarily using quite the same depth and rigor of scientific research that you have, maybe it wasn't quite available to him, um, notes the very existence of that as, as marking that humans or our ancestors at that time already had the capacity for religious expression because he characterized those paintings as religious paintings and that the capacity for religious thinking and expression had arrived by that time. Um, I want to say he also brought in the concept of ensoulment at that time, but I'm, I may be wrong, so I'll just set that aside. Um, now, what I'm trying to do is to relate that extremely simplistic, deliberately simplistic um, uh, scenario alongside this and work out how they are related if one is a allegorical abstraction in some way of the other. Because um, I, I suspect if there are others in the in the audience like me. What we're trying to do is to is to get some purchase on it um, and to and to relate it to let's say a more orthodox expression of Christ, the development of, think, of of religious thinking. What the caves? The, the caves. Comment on the caves. Yes. Okay, go ahead. You comment. You oh. go, you know them. I'm not sure that I have one, except that, yes, you know, it's remarkable. There's obviously, you know, aspects also of um, astronomy seen in there. So um, there is oh, the, the caves, yes, the, the, in southern France. So Chesterton was right to be much struck by them. This, though, is um, the date is 17,000 years ago. Yes, so comparatively That's late to where we're putting the, the beginnings of um, you know uh, human Homo sapiens uh, glimmerings of religion, right. so it's it, it'd be quite well developed by then. <laughs> I mean, seventeen thousand is like yes. right up here, and yes. through say three hundred seventy-five thousand, or mm. which is close to what we were talking about. Uh, the full rounded skull comes. And the full rounded skull is important because of three things. One is the parietals that we talked about, which shows the visual spatial navigation in supernatural space as well as natural space. Mm -hmm. So the parietals, the cerebellum, which gives you that computational capacity, and this is a really nice forebrain, which organizes it all. And makes decisions. And makes decisions. Mm. Takes decisions. It takes decisions if you're British. <laughs> it makes decisions if you're American. <laughs> okay. So it was a long time ago. In other words, seven, the, the caves. Recent. Yes, pretty but, recent. But, but a remark, but you know, certainly a lot in there. A, a lot of ourselves, you know, that we can yeah. recognize in the cave. And that, that's a, an important point as well. So, well, one has to speculate about the religion and the th their understanding of their religion, so their theology, but surely it was there. Yes. The, only, the, old, the oldest thing that I can think of that, um, and we talk about this in the book, is Homo sapiens adultu. It was a subspecies of Homo sapiens, and they carried skulls around, apparently, in a sack. And is there any evidence that this, this was religion not really but you know why do humans carry skulls around in a sack if they're not in some way revering uh, their ancestors which must have been one of the earliest mm -hmm. forms of religious 
devotion was to ancestors. And this was around 170,000? Yeah, down to, I can't, it's over 100. I can't remember exactly what it was. But, so I, but that's in our species, the different subspecies. Yes. All right. Now, um, who's who's going to be bold enough to to throw to lob something in here? <laughs> oh, gosh. Go. Don't anything, that, anything that struck people here. Um, it's 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 deeply academic and rightly so um, for the for the most part, um, but. I, I would think I would be asking if I were not in this field, where's God in all this? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, he's right there. You know, uh, there's nothing about faith in God that is not consistent with this whole model. You know, mm -hmm. where, where is Sunday school? You know, that's teaching our little kids, you know, about, <laughs> you know, rules and things. Anthony? Yes. Margaret, um, to follow up what you just said. You said there is God there. What did you mean by that? What evidence was there? Because so you mean it scientifically? Well, what I meant is two things. One was that the science does not discount the faith. And I meant it experientially because I'm a person, Chris is a person, you're people, and you believe in God, or some of us do. And so we're the proof uh, that uh, God's in this evolution. We are the evolution. It's written in our genome. We went through this. And it's natural. And it's natural. You know, it's okay. not, you know, so God is, God is, is in us. But there isn't anything, should we say, specific, because there was nothing written at this stage. We haven't got any evidence of sacrifice or anything like that, which shows a divine belief. But we know what these brain organs do. Yeah. And the other thing is, a lot of the model in the book has also more to do with cultural anthropology. There's a chapter called um, the human heart and the, the human heart and the circle of light. Yeah, and that really goes more back to Claude Lévi-Strauss, who was both an anthropologist and a philosopher, a French one. And um, he basically said that light of the, the, the hearth, that light of the campfire defines society. It defines reality. It defines what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And we better not do it if we don't, not supposed to do it. Light and darkness. Light and darkness, right. So if you're a little kid, you didn't want to go outside the light. So there's your Easter candle. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there, I know Michael's had his hand up, um, figuratively speaking. Um, Michael. Um, just to say to both of you, thank you very much for a splendid presentation. I cannot wait to read the book and, and really get into it. So uh, you've got one one buyer at least this evening. Um, just, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the Jesuit should pay for it. Do I get a discount as a Jesuit, Chris? I don't know. Um, just what about um, the definition of religion that's at work? Um, uh, now, I could put you on the spot and say, do you want to define what you mean by religion? And not in any way to, uh, to, to kind of criticize it, but is it one that would hold up in kind of general discussions uh, to to possible, um, possible critiques of, of the, the, the position you're putting forward. Okay. Um, Margaret's calling on a, a slide, so I'm just going to share. It's the one around. with the A and the B. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Stop at that one. Let's take, a, let's take a look at that. We had to think about our model, our biological model, 
and what might be reasonably expected at these levels. This was Homo erectus at 1.5 million years ago, and then Homo sapiens fully formed with a round skull at about 400,000 years ago. And so, you know, more and more people think that Homo erectus had language, at least a, 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 a junior version of language. And storytelling around the hearth, uh, ritual is conceivable, chanting, percussion, moral reasoning, right and wrong. A uh, Homo erectus in our model has a continuum from right to wrong and is able to reason and to place things on that continuum. This is the right thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. And then it jumps over into Homo sapiens. Um, and let's go. Let's go to the A and B, and that's that's more of our experiential. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is really what what is it to be religious? What is it to experience religious, a, a re, religious thinking and feeling? Um, later in the book, we talk about what might not be possible in artificial intelligence. Certainly it's easy to code right and wrong thinking, but it's not gonna be easy to code for our artificial intelligences, all these things that involve visceral reactions, emotional reactions. All, look at number one, perception and response to the spiritual, awe and wonder. I don't, I don't know whether you can code in artificial intelligence on and wonder. Maybe adoration and reverence. Mm. I don't know. Uh, what if we what if we encounter an ETI, an extraterrestrial, who's got moral reasoning but no religion? Oh well that that might make sense, you know. I mean they can tell right from wrong, but they don't have this thing, this it, it, uh, for deep experience that involves the emotions. Um, mm -hmm. So immediate experience, what's the next one? Acquiescence, oh yeah, and then commitment. You know, mm -hmm. this, is, this is more than just moral thinking. This is something that had to have a lot of different roots that were connected to viscerality. I mean, there are forms of religion where people throw up. You know, I know, you know, it's not, it's not done in the Anglican church right? <laughs> or the Catholic church, but um, there are forms of religion that, where people have extremely visceral reactions. Hmm. So did that answer your question at all? I don't know. Um, I think that continued the discussion. Um, I, I, um, I think Paul is it Paul Smith? Would you like yes, to that's go right, ahead? Yeah. Hello, Paul. Um, yeah, like the others have said, I, um, I'm not scientific at all, really, but it's really good to hear your basic message, you know, about the scientific basis for religion. And I like also the idea that it's voluntary. There's a capacity there. But, you know, in a sense, theologically speaking, God allows us the freedom to choose whether we wish to relate to God or not. Um, I was toying around with the question that you left us with right at the end of your presentation about what would, you know, E.T. look like or, or, or be like. Uh, and I guess all sorts of questions um, started coming up in my mind. Um, um, and, and the last question really that came into my mind was... Um, what makes you think that we would encounter E.T. anyway? Um, might E.T. be uh, clever and circumspect enough to decide to avoid making contact with uh, this stupid human species on planet Earth? Yeah. So, Go ahead. Yes, Paul, that's been well thought about. <laughs> there, were, uh, there are was, books on it, Paul. Exactly, and lots of science fiction. I, I, I tried to remember the name of a, um, a science fiction writer from Toronto, and I met him up there, um, who wrote two novels. Um, one was E.T. had morality, but no religion. And the other novel was exploring, yes, 
E.T. had religion. And there was fascinating exploration, but I've forgotten his name. But it was kind of set in Toronto where I did my doctorate in astronomy, so it resonated. But it, it, it was a good, you know, thought experiment on that, you know, what it would be like. Uh, and certainly, uh, well, I suppose we've got exam human examples of what it'd be like to have morality, but not religion. Um, so but but I think I think the, the thing to go back to, though, is really, what do you need to build a spaceship? Oh, okay. you know, so it, what, what, Go ahead. Yeah, so exactly what cognitively does it? Yeah, no, I mean, it you have to be a social problem solver or you can't build a spaceship, you know, or navigate it or anything. Um, so you have to have a series of social rules, and that suggests morality. A capacity for morality. A capacity for morality. Because morality is, is how to determine social rules or the application of social rules. But, you know, they could have something like religion. They could have something arbitrary uh, where they endow certain things, maybe a part of the spaceship, maybe a certain time of the day with special importance. Ritual? Ritual? Deeper than ritual. Yeah. Deeper than ritual. They could have something that looks like religion but isn't our religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our model says really that um, when religious capacity came along, it kind of took over morality. In other words, it kind of populated it, that capacity. Mm -hmm. If morality is a bucket, you know, and along comes, uh, religion it's going to it's going to make that real it's going to make it do specific things um mm. so okay. I, I i was i was interested when um when michael and was going to ask a question whether whether you were going to raise the uh, the matter of ritual because one of the things i remember from your lectures michael was uh, rene girard um and the primeval um uh, manifestation of ritual through the othering of a um, of someone who has to be ejected and the whole cycle which seems to be something which is fundamental to all societies primitive all the way through to clearly present day um, and I was wondering whether whether ritual um, might might feature um, in 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 what you were saying uh, Margaret and Chris as an external social manifestation of this capacity for religious thought well, you know, religion, uh, you know, before she died, my mentor said, religion is, ritual is not all there is to religion. You know, it's not just ritual. Ritual is a manifestation of it, but the religion is something in here, in your heart and your mind. Um, I think ri group ritual, uh, it kind of works like uh, hunting dogs in mob. Have you seen the hunting dogs in mob? And then they stake out and, and they go and they hunt the prey. You know, so it's a it's a way of exciting and and uh, and assuming a more a state of being closer to supernatural. Mm. And I think that's what ritual does. Now you can do ritual privately, you know. Um, everybody, everybody asks me, how did I know that voodoo came up from New Orleans through up with the Mississippi River and travel up uh, in the migrations, black migrations to Washington? I said, how did I, how did I know that there are a lot of black women, you know, in Washington? Uh, who were uh, uh, performing voodoo rituals in their bedrooms, you know, but they were, you know, uh, it's, it's, mm. it's endowed in culture, you know, and I think it, it mm. creates a sense of the supernatural. Okay. 
That's really interesting. Um, we've, I, I realise we've gone over the hour, so I'll move it to a close Sorry. gently. No, that's quite all right. This has been fascinating, and I think this could go on for quite some time as we develop some of these themes. But uh, Zeba, you wanted to um, make a contribution uh, here, and maybe this will be the last one before Hi, we move to close. You need to come off mute. There we are. There we go. No, you're on mute at the moment, Ziba. All right. Okay. How's, how's Brilliant. that? Brilliant. That's better. <laughs> okay. First of all, hi, Chris. Hi, Margaret. Um, it's great to see you again. And can, also, can, Michael can we, can, we, can, we, can we tell them how we know each other? Yeah, Ziba? sure. Well, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, Ziba, Ziba and Michael wrote this fantastic chapter for the book on the settlement of the moon that I just edited. So... Uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and the other book we wrote for as well, the other in the series as well. So oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the pandemic. Well, then the pandemic piece. Oh, oh yeah, and the pandemic pieces, but forget those. <laughs> I never knew what you look like. <laughs> After all this collaboration, this is the first time we've we seen each other. Delighted to be bringing you together. <laughs> yeah um i think there's what uh, first of all it was fantastic absolutely wonderful presentation is great i don't know why i haven't read your book already so i'm going out to get that on amazon immediately um but i just want to say that as a species it seems increasingly we are undervaluing the importance of religion in favor of other human capacities it seems, um, in part because we're almost wanting to create ourselves in the image of our AI, <laughs> I fear. If you follow me, <laughs> uh, as we are better able to hack the codes of life, to direct our own evolution, what is the danger that that undervaluing of religion is actually going to result in our potentially losing something very, very important to our development hitherto and our future capacity as, well, at least me as a believer in relationship to the touching of the transcendent and the supernatural, if we undervalue um, the religious capacity, which, you know, as you've expressed, is very much hardwired into us as a species and part of our evolution. That's it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, right. Okay. <laughs> it's it's a good turn. The expression we're in danger of becoming our, you know, our AI, uh, and and not, you know, expanding the, the fullness of our, our human capacities. Yes, it's uh, you know, as you say, what Margaret and I have been discovering through all this research and through all these millions of years is our amazing capacities of what, uh, of what humans are. Mm. I'm not sure I agree with Chris. I, I don't think we're gonna lose it. I don't think we're devaluing it. I just don't. You know, I think it's there. And you know, we may have a bunch of intellectuals that are kind of worming their way into, oh, we just really don't need this or something. I think it's baloney, you know, it's not going anywhere, you know. Um, I mean, as much as I am a female, I am also an individual with religious thought. And it's not, I can't get rid of it. You know, I can choose not to practice, but it's not going anywhere. And I think a lot of things that people say are religion or, or something other than religion or religion. Mm. 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 I think I don't. I don't. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think the Pope's going anywhere. I don't think Protestantism's going anywhere. Uh, you know. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's that's all that right at this uh, moment, opening up such a uh, such a. I want to say another can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm but mindful it, of yeah, the... We don't have to debate it because I, I believe more in the genetic foundation that we have. Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
It's just not exercised in so many cases. Well, That's you know, well, their problem. You know, if somebody doesn't want to engage in religious expression. You know. Yes. This 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 sounds like pub talk by the time for the time that you finally get there later in the uh, later in the day, and I'm sure that this is this seems to be another of those subjects uh, that we uh, that we have that, that we've been covering where I think the questions will occur to people on reflection afterwards, um, so it's almost as if we need a follow up session um, another time to garner all of the thoughts um, that have struck people, especially I guess after reading. Um, uh, reading your book, which I think I am going to gun for That's now after this. Too, yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Margaret. Thank you so much, Chris, for bring, bringing your whole personalities um, into this um, into this uh, lecture as well. Um, and for the and for the observations, which which clearly are just um, scratching the surface. Uh, thank you to all of you for for, for joining. Um, just a quick comment. It was in the newsletter, in fact, in the correction to the newsletter, which was my fault. Um, um, the okay. next um, in the series is already in place. Um, put a note in your diaries for Thursday, the 7th of April. Professor Paul McPartlin um, will be talking about ecumenism and the Oxford Handbook. Um, I don't know whether that's more more grounded to earth than this subject. Um, some might say not. Um, but uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming along and making this um, another memorable event um, in the series. Uh, Chris and Margaret, uh, most of all, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Hope to see you in about six weeks time. And um, if there's any feedback from any attendees um, about this event, um, others that we might hold, and ideas for things that the association might do along these lines or other lines, please do drop a note. There's a web form, um, the contact form on the website um, that you could use, uh, for instance, or of course, just re uh, reply to Annabelle's um, email and that will get to me another way. So thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Right.